Would you turn back to Hebrews chapter 2? Lord willing, tonight I'm going to be speaking on speckled, spotted, and brown. It's that story of Jacob and how he uh, got the sheep of Laban. I've entitled this message, The Son. Could I possibly be speaking on anything more important than that? The Son. The writer to the Hebrews says in verse 3, How shall we escape if we neglect? And that same word neglect is translated in Matthew chapter 22, make light of. You remember when the king had a marriage for his son and he sent out the summons to come and they all began to make light of it and went their way. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? And the reason it's so great is because of the greatness of the Son. May the Lord enable us to enter in to this, the greatness of the Son. Now, I'm going to attempt to preach on the greatness of the Son. What I'm preaching on this morning, I do not fully understand, nor do you, nor can I fully explain, but I believe with all my heart the greatness of the Son. I cannot explain it as I would, nor make it understandable to you. I can only state what's being said and pray that God will reveal it. Somebody may think, if you don't understand it, nor can you explain it well, why, pray tell, are you preaching on it in the first place? Because that is the way preaching works. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 7, we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. It's mysterious. It's not so much understood, but believed. That's what a mystery is. You believe a mystery. You'd, one God in three persons, do I understand that mystery? Of course I don't. Do I believe it with all my heart? One God in three persons. That's a mystery the gospel has revealed. And the gospel indeed is a mystery and we preach it as such we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery even the hidden wisdom you know God could hide this wisdom from me God could hide this wisdom from you I think of that passage of scripture where the last thing said of the Lord during his public ministry was he departed and did hide himself from them. Oh, I don't want him to hide himself from me. The Lord said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you've hid these things. God did this. You have hid these things from the wise and prudent and revealed them unto babes. Lord, reveal your truth to us. We're totally shut up to Revelation. As I said, I can't make this so you understand it. Only God can do that. God must be the teacher. One of the reasons I despise so many of these translations of the scripture is because they're trying to make the Bible understandable. Well, so they could understand this. No, God the Holy Spirit makes the Bible understandable, not your ability to make it simple. So I realize that this is mysterious, what I'm going to be preaching. And I 
can't explain it the way I'd want to, but I'm trusting God to take care of his word and cause us to not neglect so great a salvation. Now you'll notice in verse two of chapter, or verse one of chapter two, it begins with therefore. Therefore. Now everything I'm saying is based upon what I previously said. Therefore. Now let's go back to this first chapter. This is, this is the greatness of the Son. The greatness of the Lord Jesus Christ. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days, are we in the last days? Yes. All the days between the first and second advent of Christ are the last days. There's all kinds of things that happen, different cycles, different, but it's still the last days. I hope it's the last of the last days. Matter of fact, wouldn't you be thrilled if the Lord would come back today? But the last days have been around ever since the second, or the, since the first advent of Christ, and they will continue into the second advent of Christ when he returns. He hath in these last days spoken to us by his son. This is my beloved son. Oh, how God loves his son. This is the son of my love, the well beloved. Hear ye him. Jesus of Nazareth is the son of God. Verse 2. Whom he hath appointed heir of all things. This one who is his son is the one that he has appointed heir of all things. Now, what is this thing of Christ being the son of God? God is one God in three distinct persons. God the Son, God the Father, and God the Holy Spirit. Christ is the second person of the Trinity. All three of the persons of the one God are, and when I'm saying this, I, I know I don't know what I'm talking about, uh, but I know it's so. They're co-equal, co-eternal, of one substance. Whatever the Holy Spirit substance is, the Father substance is. Whatever the Son substance is, is the substance of the Father and the Spirit. They're of one substance. Do I understand that? No. Do I believe it with all my heart? These three, John said in 1 John 5, 7, are one. There are many sons, but there are only one son, the Son of God. As I said, I want to attempt to talk about the greatness of the Son. The reason this salvation is so great, the reason why it's such a crime to neglect it, is because of the greatness of the Son himself. This is my beloved Son. I love that scripture in Isaiah 9, 6. Unto us a child is born. Speaking of the birth of Christ. But unto us a Son is given. The Son is eternal. God the Son. Turn with me for a moment to John chapter 5. I think that this passage tells us of the union of God the Father, God the Son, and it's God the Spirit who tells us this. John chapter 5, verse 17. But Jesus answered them, My Father worketh hitherto, and I work. When he's working, I'm working. What he's doing, I'm doing. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but he said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Jesus Christ is not like God. Jesus Christ is God. The only one 
who is equal to God is God. Jesus Christ is God the Son. Verse 19, then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you that the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. Oh, he sees what the Father does. He's beholding him face to face as the Son. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. No difference. For the Father loveth the Son and showeth him all things that himself doeth, and he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. For as the Father raises up the dead and quickens them, gives them life, even so the Son quickens whom he will. He ascribes absolute sovereignty to himself in giving salvation. If you're quickened, it's because he willed you to be quickened. Verse 22, for the father judges no man, but had committed all judgment to the son that all men should honor the son even as they honor the father. He that honoreth not the son honoreth not the father which is sent him. Now this is the greatness of the son. And in our text in Hebrews chapter 2, it says, he has appointed him heir of all things. You know what that means? My dear friend, you and I belong to him. Whether you acknowledge it or not, you belong to him. I belong to him. And you and I will glorify him. That's your purpose to glorify him. Now, if he sends me to hell and gives me what I deserve, it will glorify his justice. He'll be seen as glorious in doing that. And if he sends you to hell and does not give you mercy, it'll be to the praise of the glory of his justice. And my dear friend, if he saves you, It'll be for his glory. It'll be to the praise of the glory of his grace. You will be a trophy of his grace. You will be an example of just how much salvation is by grace. But he's the heir. And you and I belong to him. And then it says, by whom also he made the worlds. Jesus Christ is the creator. He's no created being. He is the eternal son of God, the creator. This is his greatness. He's the creator. Verse 3. Who, being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. He is the glory of God. He's no reflected glory. He is the glory of God. So much so that he said, he that hath seen me hath seen the Father. That's his own testimony. He's the express image of his person. And let me say this. In heaven, all we will see of God is the man Christ Jesus. That's how glorious this one is. Oh, the greatness of the Son. And look what it says next. It says he's upholding all things by the word of his power. You know what that means? That means all things that take place in space and in time are caused by him. Everything. I can't take that too far and I'm not worried about taking it too far. He is the cause. He's the first cause of all. This is who he is. He's God. 
He's the cause of all things. There is such a thing as divine providence, and it covers everything. I hear people say all the time, well, there must be a reason for this, and they don't, you know, there is him, his will being done. He upholds all things by the word of his power, simply by a nod. He's omnipotent, and he controls everything and everybody. And then it says next, when he, in verse 3, when he had by himself purged, our sins, he sat down. Now notice the language. He by himself purged our sins. Now, I touched on this last week. We got to understand who our is referring to. He purged our sins. This is a reference to the elect of God. Very important for us to understand that. This religious generation we live in teaches that Jesus Christ died for everybody's sins. No, he didn't. If he died for everybody's sins, everybody would be saved because of who he is. We're talking about the greatness of the Son. He, by himself, purged our sins. Every believer, all of the elect, everybody for whom he died, what did he do? He purged. He purged. You know what that means? If Jesus Christ died for you, you don't have any sin. Chew on that for a moment. If Jesus Christ died for you right now, you have no sin. When he had by himself, with no help, no contributions from me or you, when he by himself purged our sins. He sat down. You see, he left nothing undone. The reason he sat down was because the sins were purged. And he sat down having finished his work. Just like the Lord said in Psalm 110, 1, the Lord said, this is David speaking, the Lord said to my Lord, sit thou on my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool. Oh, the greatness of the Son. Verse 4, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name, than they. Now he's better than the angels because he, as God, created the angels. They're just his creatures. These mighty beings, greater in might and power than me and you, they're just his creatures. And he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. As the Son, as the heir of all things, as the one who obtained eternal salvation, there's given to him a more excellent name, different in kind, surpassing in excellence, a more excellent name. Paul put it this way in Philippians 2, wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee is going to bow. You will bow. I will bow. Either now or later. And I don't want to be somebody that bows later because then it's too late. I'll just be forced to bow at that time. I want to bow now in my heart. Bow down. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Oh, the greatness of the Son. Now look in verse 5. He quotes two passages of Scripture in this verse from Psalm 2, 7 
and from 2 Samuel 7, 14. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. And again, I'll be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Now these are two Old Testament scriptures he quotes. The first out of Psalm 2, verse 7, and the other out of 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 14. The first, this day have I begotten thee. The second, thou shalt, he'll be to me, I'll be to him a father, and he'll be to me a son. Now, in Psalm 2, verse 7, I'd like you to look at that with me. Psalm 2, verse 7. Verse 7. Psalm 2, verse 7. I will declare the decree. Now, this is God's eternal decree. You see, everything that happens, happens according to his decree. And this is his chief decree of which everything else comes from. This is God, I will declare the decree, that which God decreed before time began and must be. Oh, when God speaks, it's decree. It must be. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Now, this begetting, he's called the only begotten son of God, the only begotten and well-beloved son of God. What is this begetting all about? Well, Revelation 1.5 calls him the firstborn from the dead. The only begotten is called the firstborn from the dead. This is talking about Christ's resurrection. Uh, turn with me in Acts chapter 13, and this will nail this down. Revelation 1, 5, he's called um, the first begotten from the dead. In Acts chapter 13. Verse 32, and we declare unto you glad tidings, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God hath fulfilled the same unto us their children, and that he raised up Jesus again, as it's also written in the second Psalm, what we just looked at. Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Now this is talking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now when David wrote this, it was a thousand years before it ever took place. Yet he says, this day have I begotten thee. Now, what that lets us know, this is mysterious, but it's nonetheless true. There's not, this is not an event of time, although it took place in time. There was an exact second when he was raised from the dead. It took place in time, but this is not an event of time. This is the eternal decree of God. You see, God decreed that Christ died before time began. That's why this world was created in the first place, for him to come and die. But not only is he the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, he's the lamb raised from the foundation of the world. And my standing before God eternally is in Jesus Christ and him crucified. God has never viewed any believer independent of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why did he choose me? I can answer that question in Christ. In Christ. There is no other reason. Well, he chose me because he foresaw I'd believe. Uh, that's foolishness. Don't, don't think anything like that. That's so contrary to God. That's so contrary to the gospel. That's so contrary to his character. He chose me in Christ according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Oh, you know, when I think that, it, it, tension leaves my body. I've always been viewed in Christ, and He is my salvation. And He says, I will be to Him a father. Look back in our text in Hebrews chapter 2. 
Remember, we're, try, we're trying to talk about the greatness of the Son. And like I said, we're trying. Uh, this is something that I'm sure to fail at. There's no way I can speak of him as highly as he is. There's no way you can believe as highly as he is because he's, he's beyond. But the greatness of the Son. Yeah. Hebrews 2, verse, let me get back there. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Father, the hour has come. This is the Lord speaking in John 17, 1, in his great high priestly prayer for his people. Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son, that thy son might also glorify thee. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work thou gavest to me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me with thyself, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. The Father and the Son. Verse 6. And again, when he bringeth the first begotten into the world. Look at that. When he's brought into the world, he was already the first begotten. He was already raised from the dead. When he bringeth the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. And that's talking about his birth. When he brought, don't you love to think of that heavenly host uh, after they heard the announcement, uh, the heavenly host praising God, saying, glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. That was going on then. This is when he was born. The angels of God were praising him. Verse 7. No, I'm getting ahead of myself. Verse 6. And again, when he bringeth the first begotten into the world, he saith, let all the angels of God worship him. And to the angels... He saith, who make his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. That's a high position for the angels. But unto the Son, he saith, thy throne, O God. Now, this is God the Father speaking to God the Son. And he says, thy throne, O God. Now, his throne represents his reign, his absolute sovereignty over all things. Thy throne, O God. Is forever. It's eternal. It never had a beginning. It'll never have an end. Jesus Christ is Lord, always has been Lord, always will be Lord. His throne, his sphere of sovereignty, his absolute reign and control of everything is eternal. That's how great he is. Oh, the greatness of the Son of God. He says in verse 8, a scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Now listen to this. Everything God does by way of grace, by way of mercy, by way of his love, by way of forgiveness is absolutely righteous. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it's the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for therein in the gospel is the righteousness of God revealed. Now, I am painfully aware, painfully aware of the fact that I am a sinner. I'm painfully aware of that. And I'm also aware of this, the very absolute righteousness of God demands my salvation because of what Christ accomplished on Calvary's tree. While I'm aware of my sinfulness, to some extent, not to the full extent, I don't want to know the full extent, you don't either. You don't either. But I know this. When Christ said it is finished, my sin was put away. And now the law of God and the justice of God and the righteousness of God 
demands my salvation. Now, that's the greatness of the Son. It, a scepter of righteousness is the scepter of his kingdom. Verse 9. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. What a beautiful description of Christ, isn't it? Thou hast loved righteousness, loved it, and you've hated iniquity. You can't love righteousness and not hate iniquity. You can't hate iniquity and not love right. Oh, this is what, what a beautiful description of the Redeemer. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Now, the joy of Jesus Christ. He's been anointed with the oil of gladness above his fellows. I love to think of the... I, I want to say this with proper reverence and even with fear, but the Lord Jesus Christ is happy. He's full of joy. At thy right hand, the scripture says, are pleasures evermore. And I love that scripture in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, looking into Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. What was the joy? Well, first, the joy of obeying his father. He said, my meat and my drink is to do the will of him that sent me. Oh, the excellency of Christ. The joy of saving his people. He received joy from saving me because he loved me from the foundation of the world. And what joy he received has in saving his people from their sins. Oh, the greatness of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Verse 10, and thou, Lord, this is speaking of the Christ, the Son of God. Let me remind you, he's not like God. He is God. Look what it says concerning him here, verse 10. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thine hands. Creatorship. He created all this. Verse 11, they shall perish, but thou remainest. Now everything that you see is going to perish. This world is going to be burned up. It's going to perish. Melt like fervent heat when the Lord brings in a new heaven and a new earth. That doesn't just mean the annihilation. Nothing. More. No, there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. But... This visible creation is going to perish, but thou remainest. Now here, immutability is ascribed to Christ. You remain. They all shall wax old as doth a garment, and as a vesture shall thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. The illusion is the Lord taking an old garment and wrapping it up and putting it away to be used no more. But thou art the same. Jesus Christ, the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. I'm the Lord. I changed on. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Verse 13, but to which of the angels said he at any time, sit on my right hand. I love to think of the Lord saying that to him, don't you? He said to his son, sit down at my right hand because nothing has been left undone. When he by himself purged our sins, he sat down. Sit on my right hand. Until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Now, 
He has enemies, and we see what their end is. And then he says regarding angels, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be the heirs of salvation? What is the purpose of angels? I don't know much about them. I know they're greater in power and might than we are. And I know their purpose is to be ministers of them who are the heirs of salvation. Salvation. You know, one, when I hear somebody say I got saved or so-and-so got saved, I just, I, I cringe. That is not salvation. He is salvation. Salvation is by his grace, by his righteousness. And if you're saved, you know what that means? You've been saved from your sins. That's what I need saved from. I need to be saved from my sins. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. That's what I need. I need him to do something for me because I can't do anything for myself. I need him to do something about my sin. Thank God. He shall save his people from their sins. Salvation. Now what is included in being saved from my sins? That means I never have to pay for the penalty of them. That means I've saved from the power of them. What do you mean you're saved from the power of them? Sin still seems mighty powerful to me. Just what do you mean when you say something like that? There was a time when I couldn't believe any more than I could create the world. I believe now I've been saved from the power of my sin. That's what that means. There was a time when I had no love to God at all. Matter of fact, I hated him. I love him now. Why? I've been saved from the power of my sin. That's salvation from sin. One of these days, I'm going to be saved from the very presence of sin where I won't even remember what it's like to be a sinner anymore. Now, what that is going to be like, I can't, <laughs> I can't describe, but it's so. Salvation. And angels are sent to be ministers to them who shall be heirs of salvation. Therefore, because of the incomparable greatness of the Son and the immenseness of his salvation, therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we've heard. Now, if what you've heard this morning, by the grace of God, what I've heard this morning from his word, we ought to give the more earnest heed to this. Lest at any time we should let them slip, leak out. I've seen people who seem to believe the gospel, but it appears they don't anymore. Now, I know one of God's elect cannot fall away. I'm sure of that. They will continue in the faith. But also know this, if he doesn't keep me, I will fall. It's not if, it's I will, if he doesn't keep me. And I'll let him slip out. And they'll leak out. And I don't want that to happen to me. And I don't want that to happen to you. It's that person who perseveres to the end that believes. Therefore, we ought to give them more earnest heed to the things which we've heard, lest at any time we should let them slip, leak out. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and that's talking about angels mediating the law to Moses. Gal Galatians 3 says that. Angels delivered him the law. And that word that they spoke, the law was steadfast, and there was no mercy in that law. Only judgment. If you disobey, that's all the law does is condemn and punish. There was no mercy in that law. Look what he says. How shall we escape if we neglect, make light of? So great a salvation. There's mercy in this to make light of this, to neglect it, to be negligent of this? How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? 
It's great because of the greatness of the Savior. Amen? This is a great salvation because of the greatness of the Savior. And this salvation is great because of the cost of it. It costs the life of the Son of God to save you. His precious blood had to be shed for you to be saved. And it's great because of the freeness of it. Don't dare think there's anything that you can do to appease God. That's the greatest insult that you can give him. The blood of his son and you pay something? No. It's free. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. It's great because of the end of it. I'm going to be perfectly conformed to his image. And it's great because of the width of it. Now, what do I mean by the width of it? It's this wide. Whosoever will. Whosoever will. What if I'm not elect? Forget that. You don't need to worry about that. Listen to this. Whosoever will. Let him take the water of life freely. Hold on to that. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me, I will in no wise, for no reason at all, cast off. You will be received in coming to Christ. Now, if I do neglect this, I will not escape. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Let's pray. Lord, we ask in the high holy name of thy dear son that we might be enabled to come to him, to believe on him, to rest in him, to trust him, to cling to him. Lord, let us, everyone, by your grace, be like Jacob and say, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. Lord, we need your blessing. We need you to do something for us. Do that for Christ's sake. Bless your word. In Christ's name we pray.